All right. So remember I told you that there was those four major issues, quality of service, scalability, fault tolerance. What was the fourth one? Security. Security. Very good. Right? Those are the kind of four major issues. The last part of this class will focus on one issue, really, and that's scaling networks. Right? Um, and so let's talk about that just briefly. In order to create a scalable network, an enterprise network needs to consider the ability to support critical applications that absolutely need 100% uptime. Need to support the ability for converged network traffic, voice, video, data, all that stuff on one platform. Different business needs. Some parts of your organizations may need high fast, high speed stuff. Some parts of your organization may need, doesn't matter how fast, but it's got to be ultra secure, right? And we need to provide some ability to administer all this from a central location, like our outsourced crew in India, right? We don't want to have to be able to manage it all from different areas of the world. We want to be able to kind of keep it consolidated. The India thing was a joke, although not really. All right, so uh, um, we want uh, uh, the goal of these Cisco Nexus switches, or the types of switches we're talking about, are provide a highly reliable network in the enterprise that converges all of these things together into something that we can coordinate from a central location. That's the point. So we want to create a hierarchical design to make this happen. And I'm introducing this concept right now to everybody because throughout the curriculum we'll be using these terms. These are Cisco terms. And so there's this hierarchical design to switching that you need to kind of understand. And this is it. We have at one layer the thing called the access layer. And the access layer is where the end devices connect to. So this wireless access point is at the access layer. The switch up here is at the access layer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Devices that have lots of ports on them tend to be at the access layer, right? Then you have devices that are responsible for distribution to the facility or to the location or to where the access devices are going to be. They show up in distribution facilities, usually one per building. These are distribution layer devices. These will then all come back to a centralized location, which is usually at what we call the core. Doesn't that sound really techy and cool? <laughs> it's at the core, right? Yeah. Yeah, the distribution layer uh, and the core layer is all routers? No, these are switches. Okay. These are multi-layer switches capable of communicating at many layers. So these are highly capable devices. These are dumber. They usually receive instruction. These are smarter and these rule the universe, right? The core is where all the redundancy mainly happens and where we set up the network security and all these other settings. The routers then are what handle the connectivity between our extranet, intranet, internet worlds, right? And they may or may not have firewalls involved in them. Hence the little red band of bricks around them, you see that? That's a riddle brick. Bricks mean firewall. By the way, these are routers. Whenever you see arrows pointing in like that, routers. Whenever you see something like this with arrows going into it, switches. Okay, you got it? Core, distribution, access. That will come up again and again and again and again. All right? Cisco has four things that they sell into. So when you go buy a switch from Cisco, they will sell it to you in one of four kind of schemes. Actually five if you want to count small home office. But Linksys is like the rotten stepchild. It's like hanging off to the side, right? They don't really pay attention to Linksys. But they have like a small home office division that doesn't get a lot of attention. In fact, they're threatening to sell it all the time. In fact, I think they have now. 
So, uh, <laughs> actually, just did a whole lot. <laughs> they just said the consumer is just not important anymore. So, but they have the enterprise campus, like here, Mount San Jacinto College, perfect candidate for enterprise campus, right? Where you have building access, building distribution, campus core. Then you have the enterprise edge, which is at the edge where our customers hit us or where our end users VPN in or where our students access us remotely, right? This is enterprise edge. Our web servers are at, that's the edge. Then you have the service provider edge. This is where Cisco likes to play because as all the switches get really expensive, right? And then you have remote access branch offices, teleworkers, data centers that you need to remotely connect into. Like an Amazon data center where you have your stuff hosted. Where's the red back in all this? What's that? Where's the red back in all this? Red back. Yeah. I don't I don't know what that is. Maybe it's just really old. I don't know what red back is. If you if you give me a context I might be able to tell you what it means. This is for a service provider for a while. And they would bring that to another Redback, I don't know what that means. That's okay. there, there, I've heard terminology in the telecommunications world that I don't get. Uh, and, it, and they're usually holdovers. Um, the telecommunication business have these giant switches they use. And there's a lot of holdover terminology there that I completely don't understand. Um, so that may be coming from that. There general. is a company called Redback. Uh, specializing in hardware and software used by ISPs to manage properties. Okay. It's probably a software package, which would make sense because an ISP has to deal with provisioning. So I would know what the manual process would be to provision a home user off my Cisco devices. But doing that manually every time for every subscriber could be a little complicated. So they probably log on to some software that provisions for them, which is probably what that is, I'm guessing. Okay, failures. What to do when things failures, uh, all right? So having failure domains uh, where if things fail, what to deal with. When we create our switch structure, we can create areas for things to fail. And if things do fail, we'll know the symptoms and behavior patterns for when it does fail in that particular domain, right? So as the larger your network gets, the more complicated you get in planning, okay, when things do fail, what's the behavior and the connectivity going to be like when it does fail. So we set up little scenarios so we can understand those. To simplify troubleshooting, to make deployment easier, lots of different reasons. We want to consider scalability in that. And then we also want to plan for redundancy, which is what I wanted to get to. So one of the big things we're going to focus on in the third class is switch redundancy. So most of us buy switches and we just daisy chain them together. That's our concept of the switch world. Switch, connected to switch, connected to switch, connected to switch, done. But that's not what really goes on. In the switching world, we connect them all in and we drill them a whole bunch of different paths. And the reason why we do that is so if one path fails, we have redundancy, right? So we need to, in order to do that, we have to have special protocols to make that happen. So enter the wonderful world called spanning tree. And so we get to learn about spanning tree, providing redundant paths. <laughs> Another thing we want to do, instead of having one device, and this is getting big with virtualization. Have you heard that term, virtualization? Mm -hmm. This is the buzz term of the 2000s, virtualization. The buzz term, buzz term of the 90s was uh, convergence. Now it's virtualization. Nowadays, when a sales guy walks into a, a, a company, the first question he asks is, what percentage virtualized are you? Right? It used to be they ask you, have you done convergence yet? Now the newbie sales guy asks, how much, how, what percentage virtualized are you? And the IT always, guy always throws out a guess. Oh, we're 60% virtualized. Like he really knows, right? What do they mean when they say that? I'm 60% virtualized. My servers are now virtualized. I'm no longer running my servers on bare metal, is the term they use. I don't have a uh, software installed on a server. 
I have, a, I have my server installed in a virtual environment, which is then running on a server. The reason? One piece of hardware can run multiple servers. So I'm virtualizing, saving energy, saving money, saving time, saving this, saving that, right? Virtualization. So in virtualization worlds, when I have one piece of hardware, like a server, communicating my network, I can't just have it go down one pipe, one connection to the switch. I need to combine multiple connections together in order to handle all the connectivity. Hence the neat term to bond network connections together. The term, the Cisco term for this is, is called ether channel. So we create an ether channel. The real term for this is called LACP, link aggregation. We aggregate links together so that we can handle a larger amount of communication between access and distribution or distribution and core. Do you follow me on that? Yeah. So this is a big term, big need today. So redundant links, but also bonded links to get more bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, are trunks involved in, uh, in these? Are trunks. These are trunks. All Ether channels are trunks. Yeah. Even to a virtual server. Yes. If I have my server connected into this guy, the server would have an 802.1Q <laughs> capable card that would trunk into the switch in the same fashion as a switch would. Does somebody have a question over there? I saw a hand timidly go up. That one Q is usually you uh, 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 configure it on the router. Which yeah, you configure on the router or a switch. switch Mostly on switches. What's that? One single NIC. Or one single NIC. So one cable. Well, most modern servers now are coming with NICs with multiple ports. Okay. And a lot of them have fan outs on them now. So it's a, a specialized port with a fan out. Or it's a NIC with like four or five ports on it. Like, look at that server up there. It's got like 12 ports on it. Yeah. Servers is just magnified more. And there's servers that are capable of trunking, which is a concept that you probably don't understand right now. But trunking gives me the ability to, to have different networks coming through one port. That's the, the loose explanation of it. But that's why we have the third class in this series, so you can understand trunking. We also can expand the access layer with access points connected into our access layer. And we also have to deal with trunking and multiple paths in. We might have an SSID, you know what that is? That's the wireless little thing you type in when you get when you when you browse your wireless networks, you can see the wireless networks you connect to, that's an SSID. So you might have one for your public and you might have one for your employees. So this guy could be capable of delivering two of them. That's what we have here. I have one that I connect to, and then you have the annoying one that you connect to. You have to log in all the time? I don't have that problem. <laughs> right? Yeah, and you can go out on different frequencies, different security requirements. Okay? Then we have this wonderful thing called routing protocols, which after you learn the basics of route and switch, the rest of your time will be spent learning routing protocols. Routing protocols are what make the internet work, right? So if you hang out in these classes, eventually you're going to learn what, how the internet works, right? And it works based on routing protocols. So <coughs> routing protocols allow these routing devices to share all their paths with each other. So the routers here know all about the MSJC pathways, but I could not expect the routers over at another company to know about MSJC's paths. Somehow they got to share data back and forth so they can know how to get to each other. Routing protocols do that. You've got interior routing protocols that handle local stuff, and you've got exterior routing protocols that handle internet stuff. There's only one. I said it plural because there's multiple, but the only one we use, and it's called BGP. So BGP is what makes the world work. It's called Border Gateway Protocol. BGP's up into version 4, and that's the yellow area. That's what makes these guys talk to each other. But we're going to be talking about OSPF, EIGRP, RIP, RIP version 2, and a variety of others. All right. I'm finished with the introduction to that. That's all I wanted to talk about in there. Any questions about some of the more complicated stuff?
All right, let me stop my little thing. Oh, 